Welcome to our Thursday Bible study, and we are in the midst of the book of Judges. I am J.P. O'Connor. I'm senior pastor here at West Covina Hills. Mm -hmm. This is Jillian Lutz, who is our associate youth pastor here at uh, West Covina Hills. And we're excited again to be mm -hmm. in the book of Judges. Oh, yeah. And we have some retribution coming. Yes. Some of the payback for evil, which... Um, I won't. I, it, was, it was a little heavy walking out of last uh, recording last yeah. week. So we're, we're we're ready for some catharsis, <laughs> some revenge. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of reading, but also um, it's story, which is nice mm -hmm. uh, and and ends well. Well, I won't say well, but ends dramatically. How's that? Well, I don't know. I think it's a good ending. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Would you open us in prayer? All right, time? Lord God, thank you so much that you hear people's cries for justice that when we turn our things over to you, you take vengeance on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So last time we finished, uh, there was a proclamation against the people of Shechem for their participation in what Abimelech had done to uh, his 70 brothers. And as we get into this point in the story, Abimelech is reigning over Israel. He has made himself king. He is king. And now we're going to kind of get into the story a little bit and find out what happens to him uh, in his reign. The Bible says in verse 22 of chapter 9 of the book of Judges, Judges chapter 9, verse 22, the Bible reads, After Abimelech had reigned over Israel for three years, God sent a spirit of ill will between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem, Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. Let's stop here. Um, interesting that God sends a spirit of ill will. I think that means mm -hmm. that they all of a sudden didn't like each other anymore. I really feel like God didn't have to send a very strong spirit to make these two... Uh, After Jotham's speech? Yeah, you know, it probably didn't take very much for mm -hmm. them to uh, part ways. But it looks like they started these two friends all of a sudden now were against each other. And, and I have to think that the people of Shechem realized that Abimelech had tricked them or dealt treacherously with them. Mm -hmm. And now they're going to deal treacherously with him, which is a major theme of the book of Judges. Mm -hmm. It's retribution. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's really what it's at. And there's payback mm -hmm. coming here. Verse 24, that the crime done to the 70 sons of Jerubal might be settled and their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother who killed them, and on the men of Shechem who aided him in the killing of his brothers. And the men of Shechem set men in ambush against him on the tops of the mountains, and they robbed all who passed by along the way, and it was told to Abimelech. So it looks like basically it's a Robin Hood situation mm -hmm. where Shechem used to be a friend, but now Shechem is sending out some people to rob um, to rob Abimelech's servants and his caravans and uh, anyone bringing in taxes here you go rob the rich to I don't know what they're fund their the money there you go but they are definitely against Abimelech and now they're fighting against him verse 26 now Gal the son of Ebed came with his brothers and went over to Shechem and the men of Shechem put their confidence in him so now they have their own mm -hmm. guy now it's Gaul against Abimelech. So there's this uh, mm -hmm. power struggle going on. Verse 27. So they went out of their fields and gathered up grapes from their vineyards and trod them and made merry. And they went into the house of their God, ate, drank, and cursed Abimelech. That sounds like fun. Yeah. It's a party, right? Um, you, okay. Uh, it is kind of interesting that the Bible's pointing out that they decide to go out, get the grapes, trample them, prepare some wine, and drink it as part of a party. This um, was a premeditated party. It sure is. Like, they're saying, we are going to party in hating Abimelech. Uh, which, oh, you know... Like a far more serious roast. <laughs> you know, the thing that gets me about this story is is that they're the ones who were convinced by Abimelech. Like, nobody twisted their arm or yeah. forced them to do this. Now, all of a sudden, he's, like, bad? You're bad, too. They're all bad. By the way, that's what makes a lot of these stories in the book of Judges gray, is because they're all bad. It's really hard to find any goodness in yeah. some of these stories. Ugh, it's ugly. 
and it continues to be ugly. Verse 28, Then Gaul, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech? Who is Shechem, that we should serve him? Is he not the son of Jerubbaal? And is not Zubal his officer? Serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem, but why should we serve him? If only this people were under my authority, then I would remove Abimelech. So he said to Abimelech, Increase your army and come out. Did he really just go all the way back to Hamor? He did. Whoa! He went all the way back. What is interesting at this point? That's old Is baggage. that he's throwing out this speech to try to get everybody riled up? The thing is, is that he doesn't have an army. What? Who is he going to fight again? I mean, Shechem's a city. But um, at this point, it looks like Jerubbaal has some leadership over Israel. Uh, you know, it doesn't seem like he has a chance, but Gaul has, Gaul has gallstones. I don't know. He, he's, he's, uh, he's <laughs> that was a terrible joke. I, I apologize for that. Seriously. Um, he, he seems like he has more than what he, I don't know. He's puffed up over nothing. That's what I feel like. But he's convincing the people of Shechem to join him, which makes Shechem just ridiculous. But bringing up Hamor, okay, for those of you unfamiliar with the story, because most people in Genesis skip it, and probably with good reason, the story of Hamor, Hamor was a prince of Shechem who um, fell in love with one of the daughters of Jacob, of Dinah. Israel, Dinah, and um, took her and raped her. But he was so in love with her that he tried to make things right afterwards and negotiate with her father and all of this stuff. And her brothers were all like, sure, you can marry her if you all get circumcised. And he was so in love with Dinah, or so interested in their wealth or whatever, that um, they complied immediately, which is kind of amazing if you think about it. It is. And while they were in pain, Dinah's brothers came through and slaughtered everyone in the city. They sure did kill them all. So the fact that he's bringing up Hamor is like he's trying to fire up very, very old history to make these people mad. Because if we're talking about the native Shechemites, the ones who had bad blood with Jacob, he's also making it about the fact that Abimelech is descended from the brothers who slaughtered them. And I'm like, that is a long, long time. This would be like if we were trying to start a war with England over the original grievances of the revolution, you know? <laughs> it's not gonna fly, but it did yeah. fly with these people because sometimes hurt uh, lingers, uh, yeah. pain lingers, and Galton is sticking his finger on an old wound that seems to be sore and festering. Yeah. Verse 30. When Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gaul, the son of Ebed, his anger was aroused. He sent messages to Abimelech secretly saying, Take note, Gaul, the son of Ebed, and his brothers have come to Shechem, and he here they are fortifying the city against you. Now therefore, get up by night, you and the people who are with you, and lie in wait in the field. And it shall be as soon as the sun is up in the morning, you shall rise early and rush upon the city. And when he and the people who are with him come out against you, you may do to them as you find opportunity. That's kind of a lame plan. Um, just hide in the darkness until the sun comes up and then uh, run towards the city wall and he'll come out and fight against you. Isn't that what every battle is? It doesn't even make sense. Like there's no plan or strategy here. This this person, Zebul, is a terrible friend or advisor or whatever he is. He's awful. Are, are you feeling me? Yeah. What's the plan? I don't even see the plan. Like. There's no sneak attack. There's no, uh, yeah, Th this is not, uh, yeah, anyway. I'm just disappointed in the plan. I've heard capture the flag strategies that are more thought out than this. Please, there, I am totally with you. Verse 34, so Abimelech and all the people who were with him rose by night and lay in wait against Shechem in the four companies. When Gal the son of Ebed went out and stood at the entrance of the city gate, Abimelech and the people who were with him rose from lying in wait. And when Gal saw the people, he said to Zebul, Look, people are coming down from the tops of the mountains. But Zebul said to him, You see the shadows of the mountains as if they were men. Oh, so okay. Okay, so there was a plan So there is here. some plan here. Okay, Zebul thought, I'm an advisor, but I secretly work for Abimelech. I'm going to trick Gaul into thinking it's nothing. Verse 37, so Gaul spoke again and said, No, look, 
See, those are people coming down from the center of the land, and another company is coming up from the diviner's temperance tree. Then Zebul said to him, Where indeed is your mouth now, which you said, Who is Abimelech that we should serve him? Are not those the people who you despised? <laughs> Go out if you will and fight with them now. By the way, this is... Oh my goodness, this is amazing. This is classic soap opera. Uh, turn. You know what? If this was a Broadway show, people would be like, oh! like cheering, uh, you know... He turncoats, right? And I'm thinking of the actors from Shakespeare in the Park. Absolutely. This is classic turncoat. Verse 39. So Gaul went out, leading the men of Shechem, and fought with Abimelech. Why? He's behind walls. Shoot arrows. Don't, don't leave the city. But he does. He goes out and he's fighting. Verse 40. Abimelech chased him, and he fled from him, and many fell wounded to the very entrance of the gate. Then Abimelech dwelt in Aruma. And Zebul drove out Gaul and his brothers so that they would not dwell in Shechem. Looks like Gaul lost. Yeah. Doesn't surprise me. So Zebul wanted to rebel, but then had cold feet at the last minute. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't like the Zebul. No, no, no. Gaul, Gaul got cold feet at the last minute. Yeah. Gaul, yeah, he's not, he's not very good leadership material. Um, one good speech a king does not make. So, Gaul, uh, Gaul, his story ends bad. By the way, great name if you're playing like the Bible, uh, you know, guessing game. The story of Gaul, I bet you nobody knows the story of Gaul. You can I see. bet it's going to be on the PBE questions. That would be a good one, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Anyway, back to our story. Verse 42. And it came to pass the next day that people went out into the field and they told Bimlech, so he took his people, divided them into three companies, and lay wait in the field. And he looked, and there were people coming out of the city, and he rose against them and attacked them. 44. Then Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the gate of the city. And the other two companies rushed upon all who were in the fields and killed them. So Abimelech fought against the city all that day. He took the city and killed the people who were in it, and he demolished the city and sowed it with salt. Oh, come on. That's just excessive. So it wasn't enough. Here we go. Wasn't enough that he defeat Gaul, who was his enemy. Now he's going to make Shechem pay for their treachery, which is interesting because they had already committed treachery against the people he wanted them to be traitorous. But now that they're treacherous towards him, he's going to punish them for being treacherous, which he already knew. Uh, by the way, my English language is falling apart here as I talk, but... Um, I, I just I just feel like this is um, a, a sad state of affairs. People of Shechem were a mess. Abimelech is a mess. Zebul is a mess. Gaul is a mess. There's a lot of mess here. It really is, and it's remind you know what you said there is reminding me of why like I have only performed one wedding, but okay. a wedding I will never perform is if someone cheated on their spouse and wants to marry the uh, marry the person they cheated with because it's not just about church policy this is a horrible life decision because um what makes you think that they'll stay faithful to you i mean seriously this is this is this is the same thing in in, in like you know okay so this person already betrayed so and so and you know there's so many turns of betrayal, I'm losing track here. After a certain point, betrayal is a habit, and maybe you just don't want to be hanging out with people who have betrayal as a habit. The theme of the book of Judges is this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? I always come back to that right. as we're discussing. Right. When I look at this story, at this point, they're repaying each other back and forth. There's no line that's been crossed until mm -hmm. this very last sentence where... He killed all the people of Shechem. Then he demolished the city and, and then sowed, sowed it, it with salt. salt. Which, by the way, that's to make, make it impossible for them to grow food. Right. And that's just wrong. Okay? In the, in the laws of Moses, there's stuff against actually harm. There's stuff against harming crops and farmland mm -hmm. and trees. Because you're killing the future. You're killing yeah. the ability to produce. You're killing... Yeah, anyways, God made that land. It was meant to produce. Yeah. 
Here's the thing is that he crossed the line of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Mm -hmm. There's no justice here. This is blatant revenge, mm -hmm. which is interesting because it's revenge for them betraying him, but they're already people who betray. Yeah. It's not like he should be surprised by this. They, they're they already betrayers, and he knew it because he convinced them to betray mm -hmm. the, the 70 brothers. So mm -hmm. eh, it's just such a mess. 46. When all the men of the Tower of Shechem had heard that, they entered the stronghold of the temple of the god Bereth. And it was told Abimelech that the men of the Tower of Shechem were gathered together. So Abimelech went up to Mount Zalmon. He and all the people were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bough from one of the trees. And he laid it, a branch, by the way, branch from one of the trees, and told the people who were with him, What you see me do, make haste and do as I've done. So each of the people likewise cut down his own bow and followed Abimelech, put them against the stronghold, and then set the stronghold on fire above them so that all the people of the Tower of Shechem died, about a thousand men and women. So it's not enough. You know, they're hiding inside of a tower. How can they hurt him? No, he's not finished. He's destroyed their fields. He's destroyed every building. But you see, there's some people left alive in this tower, and he has to kill everybody, every single one and so he burns out the tower verse 50 <laughs> then abimelech went to thebes and he camped against thebes and took it but there was a strong tower in the city by the way he's not done his anger campaign is not finished now he's going to the next city and he's going to start killing the people there he's a psycho mm -hmm. if he can kill his 70 brothers he doesn't care about killing strangers. Mm -hmm. He's sick. So, uh, but there was a strong tower in the city and all the men and women of the people of the city fled there and shut themselves in. And they went up to the top of the tower. So Abimelech came as far as the tower and fought against it. He drew near to the door of the tower to burn it with fire. Same plan. Okay, he's gonna do the same thing. Verse 53, but a certain woman dropped an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Sorry, I shouldn't be grinning. <laughs> First of all, what, is, what does the people of Thebes have to do with this story? Uh, and what? why are they being killed and slaughtered? I have no idea. He was going to burn them all alive in a tower. This woman has the right to defend herself. Mm -hmm. So she's perfectly within her rights. And they take whatever's at hand and they're tossing it off the top of the tower to try to stop what's happening. Mm -hmm. She is lucky, throws off the millstone and hits Abimelech in the head. Mm -hmm. who, is the, who is the cause of all of this anger and death and war right now anyway? He's the cause. Yeah. So the millstone hitting him means that the story's almost over. You know, because his generals and people, they're just following his commands because he was the king, right? His father was the king anyway. <laughs> so yeah, the woman, um, the woman throws it off and hits him in the head and crushes his skull. 54, but he's not dead. By the way, I, I looked this up in the past. I didn't look it up recently. But the upper millstone uh, is the one that rolls around so I, I don't know if you know think of millstone in the old days but there would be a flat stone underneath mm -hmm. and then you would roll the upper stone to crush mm -hmm. uh, so it had to be light enough that it would be able to move but heavy enough that it could crush corn mm -hmm. so from what I've heard and I don't know that you know just getting 25 pounds 30 pounds that sounds that's about right like a kettlebell that's a lot of weight you get yeah. hit by a rock from a top of a tower 30 you're done mm -hmm. and he knew he was dead he knew his head was crushed and in verse 54 he called quickly to a young man his armor bearer and said to draw your sword kill me lest the men say of me a woman killed him all right let, let me stop here <laughs> you're about to die and what you're worried about is what people are going to say about you when you are massacring innocent people you killed your brothers and what you're worried about is on my tombstone it's going to say a woman killed me Ironically enough, um, this story shows up later when King David is mad at one of his generals. Um, mm -hmm. He actually tells one of his generals, Don't you remember the story of Abimelech whose head was crushed by a millstone? I told you not to get so close to the wall. 
<laughs> it's so, in the Bible. So, and not only is it in the Bible, it's in a portion of the Bible that's so old that David was able to quote it to one of his generals <laughs> later on in the Bible. So he was remembered for being killed by a by a woman, even though he took this measure. By the way, it's written right here. So his attempt to try to eliminate history so nobody would know failed. Everybody knew that he didn't die by the sword of his armor bearer. A woman got him. And they mm. wanted to make sure that that's what would be known mm. about him. By the way, when he's raised in the resurrection of the wicked, <laughs> I, his sign around his neck is going to say killed by a woman. <laughs> Okay, that's what it's going to say. Oh, Lord of mercy. <laughs> Draw your sword and kill me lest men say of me a woman killed him. So his young man thrust him through and he died. Verse 55. When the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed. Every man to his place. They didn't want to be there. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to be killing these people either. But their king was telling them to do it. Mm -hmm. Verse 56. Thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to his father by killing his 70 brothers. It's eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. What's the penalty for him killing his brothers? His own death. Mm -hmm. So a death for a death. Now, you could say, well, it's 70 to 1. That's not fair. That's not the point. Mm -hmm. The recompense is death for a death. He yeah. deserved death, and he received it. God mm -hmm. paid him for his sin. Verse 57, and all the evil men of Shechem, God returned on their own heads, and on them came the curse of Jotham, the son of of Jerubal, which says something too. Their betrayal, uh, their murder of, murder of the 70 sons, plus the speech of, mm -hmm. of uh, Jotham, that all came upon their heads too. They suffered, they died, mm -hmm. and salt was sowed upon their land. Their houses were destroyed. Um, there was nothing left of their city. They also received, uh, for their betrayal, a just recompense for what mm -hmm. they did. They were killed. That was their just recompense. And they become a sign uh, to others. Mm -hmm. You were going to say something, I'll let oh, you go. Just, you know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth justice was actually meant to put a limitation on the violence. Mm -hmm. And there are several points in this story where if they had stuck to just an eye for an eye or just a tooth for a tooth, many lives would have been saved. So maybe it's not so wrong to be like, hmm, okay. Abimelech's gone, so he can't keep on escalating it. He would have. He was yeah. a psychopath. Yeah. You know, there's nothing wrong with him dying in this story. It's a good thing. Mm -hmm. He needed to die yeah. because he wasn't going to end. He had the armies of Israel out. They were following his orders. He defeated the city of Shechem. Now he's at Thebes. Why? Why is he there? Because he's not finished. Mm -hmm. He's going to keep killing and rampaging. Yeah. No, and this man needed to go down and God... The Bible says that this was God's judgment against him, mm -hmm. and, and he deserved it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to dig for a spiritual lesson here. Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, but you're God gonna, returned on their... Me from God this? returned on their... The, 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 the punchline is in the last... Is in the very last Go ahead, give it um, to me. verse. God... Uh, the evil of the men of Shechem, God returned on their own heads. It was kind of an ancient way of saying, what goes around comes around. Mm. You know, you sow violence, you receive violence. And on them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jared Baal. Jotham got his justice. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, Jotham was probably still alive at this time and finally had the peace of knowing that the man who murdered his brothers was finally gone. Uh, you know, when we go through these, but, but yes, you make a great point. Thank you for ending it well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one of the things I love about Judges is that in a lot of the stories, none of the characters are great. And I think there's a point to that in that God somehow still manages to correct for co the collective insanity of human beings. I, I love the idea that none of us are perfect. Mm -hmm. I wish that that could be the theme of God's church on earth. Mm. That none of us are perfect. Mm. He is perfect. And Christ in us is the hope of glory. Mm. I, I just feel that um, the, the weakness that's being shown here in the Bible, um, and yet God is still in control, mm -hmm. should help us to know that even in today's day, God is still in control. Oh, yeah. This is his church. He's yeah. God. We're not perfect. We're not doing we're not doing it all right um but you know what he's still with us 
um, and he's still watching over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Your word is so exciting. This millstone falling out of the sky. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you for this woman, courageous and strong, who who uh, makes a decision she's going to help to save her family, to save her, her city. Um, God, I just pray that uh, as we are thinking about these lessons from your word, that we will also choose to follow you, realizing we're, we're weak, we're flawed. Uh, you are still in control. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm.